And the winner is Robin Cost Lewis for a Voyage of the Sable Gates. I was totally chilling at my table with my buds. Oh my God. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm okay. Um, thank you very much for this profound and unfathomable honor. Thank you to the National Book Foundation and most especially to the judges wherever you are in the room for your generous attention. Um, for the rest of my days, I will never forget this moment. I will never forget it. Thank you. Um, I prepared a little thing to say because I'm really type A and trust me, you don't want me to ad lib at the mic. I can't do what Neil just did, there's no way. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the longest epic in the world called the Mahabharata. There is a minor character I love very much. His name is Akalavya, and he is the son of the king of outcasts, which means he is the prince of outcasts, as it were. And he aspired to be a great archer, but and there is always a but, right? So his but was that in order to achieve his goal, he wanted to study at the court with Drona, the master archer. But Ekalavia was from the woods, he was low-born, and Drona was the archer of the court, and so of course Drona had to reject him. But Ekalavia was determined, and so he instead went back into the woods and built a mud statue of Drona and practiced before it every day for many, many, many years. And then one day, all of the princes from the court found a deer in which there was a constellation, sorry, a constellation of arrows in his mouth. He had been killed. And they could not imagine what magic had taken place to kill this deer because no one, only a god, could perform that kind of archery. Indeed, it turned out to be Ekalavia. And when they confronted Ekalavia, they were like, how did you learn to be a master of archery? He said, well, I built a statue of the court archer Drona, and I performed before him for years and years and years. And it was because of his devotion that the gods, because of Ekalavia's devotion to his teacher, to Drona, that the gods granted him sublime vision and incredible skill. I begin with this story not be only because I love epic and not only because I love the Mahabharata, but because I've had the profound honor of studying with some of the greatest poets of our time. In my own mind, I have fashioned countless statues of writers who have honored me with their attention and time. If there is indeed anything worthy of praise or attention in my book, it is because I have copied and stolen from these illustrious writers every gorgeous and strong and sharp gesture and evil trick that I could mime. Their exquisite generosity is one of the primary reasons I am standing here tonight. To this end, please allow me to thank my teachers first. Mary McHenry, Nina Payne, the great Caribbean poet Andrew Salkey, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, Marilyn Nelson, Kate Flint, Percival Everett, Deborah Landau, Yusef Komenyaka, Toy Derricott, Cornelius Eady, and most especially the person I call the Sharon Code because she's so magical, Sharon Olds, who sat with me through the writing of the long title poem of my book, Voyage of the Sable Venus. Thank you deeply. Thank you as well to the institutions who've supported my work, NYU, USC, and Hampshire College. Um, I'm going to skip, but over the past year, I've begun to learn about the differences between a manuscript and a book. This is my first book, which is why I'm blown away. I don't know what I'm doing standing here right now. But um, I could never imagine that a manuscript could be handled so tenderly or with such profound respect as mine has been by Alfred A. Knopf. Um, a little known story about Knopf, it's weird. When I was a little girl, I used to start drawing Borzois obsessively when I was about seven. Okay, go figure. And, and then later, but still long before I became a writer, I got very interested in censorship. And so 
Alfred A. Knopf, the historical person, came into my field because I was doing research on censorship in the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice. What is not known about Alfred Knopf generally is that this man put aside tens of thousands of dollars, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, to prepare for litigation. He was so devoted to his authors that no matter what, he, he protected them. He, you can publish whatever you want, and I will litigate to protect you. So um, he went on to practice his literary activism in terms of African-American literature. He was the first person to publish Langston Hughes, Nella Larson. He went on to publish Zora Neale Hurston. And of course, my national treasures, Toni Morrison, Maya Angelou, Tracy K. Smith, Kevin A. Young. So it's a profound honor for me that my maiden launch is with this house for a long historical arch. I just want to thank the people who worked on my book, Sonny Mehta, you, Sonny Mehta, that guy. Annie Eggers, Josephine Cowles, Stephanie Ross, Sung Yoon Kwan, Andrew Craven, Paul Bogards, Brittany Marangiello, Ellen Feldman, Susan Brown, Judy Kiviat, Edith Balthazar, Kathy Horigian, Nicholas Latimer, and most especially to my editor, the sublime Deborah Garrison. Thank you for approaching my work and me, Deb, with such meticulous and tender and profound respect. As E.E. As e. E. Cummings once wrote, nobody, not even the rain, has such small hands. Thank you. I'm going to take just a little bit more of your time. I'm sorry. Family comes in many guises. I found an almost mythical second home in the Cave Canem Foundation. Thank you for your contribution, Cave Canem, and for allowing me to take part in what is surely one of the richest moments in American poetry. I'm a child of the 60s and 70s, and hence I remember that terrific line, I don't remember in what movie, where Billy Dee Williams says, and it's like blue fur, whatever, to Dinah Ross, he says, she is a friend of my mind. And so I finally would like to thank my family and friends who have been the best friends my mind could ever have hoped for. Thank you, Sheila Coleman in Cambridge, Adrian Perry, Alice Flaherty, Claudia Rankin, Elizabeth Alexander, and most especially my deliriously good and perfect sister, Candy Lewis Watkins. I need to imagine also that my father and aunts and grandparents and cousins are all sitting on a star right now watching all of us while they're playing bid whist and laughing. Daddy, this is your night. Maman, this is your day. And to my exquisite son, Henri, this award is completely for you. Thank you for your profound patience and love. I want to end with a poem, because it's appropriate, by Pablo Neruda. Um, in light of what is happening all over the world, and has been happening all over the world, not just for centuries, but for millennia, I'd like to read a beautiful poem by him before I leave called Keeping Quiet. Now we will count to 12, and we will all keep still. For once on the face of the earth, let's not speak in any language. Let's stop for one second and not move our arms so much. It would be an exotic moment without rush, without engines. We would be all together in a sudden strangeness. Fishermen in the cold sea would not harm whales, and the man gathering salt would look at his hurt hands. Those who prepare green wars, wars with gas, wars with fire, victories with no survivors, would put on clean clothes and walk about their brothers in the shade doing nothing. What I want should not be confused with total inactivity. Life is what it's about. I want no truck with death. If we were not so single-minded about keeping our lives moving and not, and for once could do nothing, perhaps a huge silence might interrupt the sadness 
of never understanding ourselves and of threatening ourselves with death. Perhaps the earth can teach us as when everything seems dead and later proves to be alive. Now I'll count to 12 and you keep quiet and I will go. Thank you for this profound award, not only for my work, but most especially for your, the attention your honor gives to the very traditions from work my work springs. I'm very honored to be here. Thank you so much.